Church, good morning. 9 a.m., you're wide awake, and uh, scooch is now a word you will hear regularly at the 9 and 11 service. So if you need a seat and you're outside and want to come in, there's some up front. There's, there's a new row next to the railing. Um, we're trying to cram as many seats, which is a good problem to have. And I thought, you know, I preached some pretty in, intense things last week, and I'm like, great, you know, people won't come back. Um, <laughs> which is benefit, it benefits us, it gives us some seats. <laughs> and then I realized that's probably what the Lord wants to do. So I'm going to preach, we're in Reconstructing Church. And if you have a Bible, you pull out your Bibles, let's get those Bibles out. Thank you for bringing them. We're so, I'm so glad you're here. I'm going to give you a quick recap if you missed it. Last week, we started a series which was resonated with a lot of us, just the, this moment of time. Um, but we are doing this series called Reconstructing Church, and basically we want to build a church that looks like Jesus. That's our attempt. As we look at the scriptures and, and frame what it means to be the church today, um, we want to build a church that looks like Jesus. We want to be a biblical church. So we're going to frame all of the teaching through scripture. If you're new to that, welcome. We're so glad. We love the word. We believe it's authoritative, not just for the church, but for our life as humans. Um, two things I want to just present. Last week, I made this case that if we want to be a biblical church, we, we must exist for God's purposes. The church, the community of God exists for God's purposes. Today, I'm going to talk about how if we want to be the church, that we must be spirit-filled. That we cannot be a church without the Holy Spirit. In fact, we, don't, we know exactly when the church started. We actually know what time it started. It started at 9 a.m., 50 days after the Passover. All right, we'll get to that in a second. L little review, are you okay? This is the fresh one for all of you um, that, like to, that don't want to be offended in life. Sorry, in advance. Here we go. The church is not a building, a brand, a website, a bunch of Christians hanging out and drinking $5 coffee to discuss their emotions. I wanted to put that in writing so you could see it. A bunch of Christians singing song to feel warm fuzzies. It's not a social network designed for political power. Let that sit for a little bit. 2024, here we come. A group of people discussing what they like about the Bible. Or a group mobilized for simply social justice. Okay, the church is, here it is, a covenantal community living as disciples of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, continuing the mission of God. So there's four words that you have to have as a church. Here's a little diagram. You need them all. You need first covenantal community. You need the mission of God. You need the presence of God, his Holy Spirit, and you need the intentionality of formation and discipleship. And what we've done over the years is, um, and in and, and seasons, is we like to overemphasize and deemphasize based on our context, culture, our personal preference. So we, when we start little churches, like when we started the garden, we came from a mega church, and in me was like this rejection of the mega church. I was the 20-something deconstructing faith back then going, we'll never be past 100 until we were past 100. <laughs> and my skepticism changed. And I'm like, well, God keeps bringing people. What do we do with that? Well, maybe, God, maybe God's not against the size, which I'll talk about also in Acts chapter 2, because the moment the church was born, it was over 2,000, just so you know. So if you don't like more people, you shouldn't be a part of the church. And you're not going to love heaven. <laughs> Go, will you go back to that? So, so sometimes we emphasize community. We want community, but we don't want his mission. And we, come, we become insulated. So some of us love the mission, but don't want formation. We want to be evangelists and reach the lost and be in the places that Jesus was, but we don't want to become like Jesus and deal with those hidden secrets that sh uh, shouldn't be happening in our life. Some of us love formation because it's much like in our culture, a self-project problem with the formation, spiritual formation, or even discipleship movement today, is we make it our me, myself, and Jesus self-project. I can just do my little fast and pray my little prayer apart from everyone else. I can just do my retreats and do the spiritual disciplines without community, without the mission of God, or without his presence. You can't have formation without the other three. You guys good? And then there are communities that just, everything is about presence, and I, we are a presence church. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit today. But we have to pursue the Holy Spirit in a context of mission. 
in a context of covenant community. This isn't a gathering with a bunch of bodies. This is the people of God covenanted together through relationship where we carry each other burdens. It's not an event where you get zapped. It's an, ex it's an encounter with the Lord that requires covenant together for the long period of time, which requires us being transformed in the likeness of Jesus for his mission on earth. Are you guys okay? So the church is all of this. Mission, presence, formation, community. Get used to it. You guys, that's, that's a little review theologically. You guys okay with this? Yeah. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit today. I want to quote Billy Graham. He said this, Everywhere I go, I find that God's people lack something. They are hungry for something. Their Christian experience is not all that they expected. And they often have recurring defeat in their lives. Christians today are hungry for spiritual fulfillment. The most desperate need of our nation today is that men and women who profess Jesus be filled with the Holy Spirit. I would say that this is true today as much as it was in Billy's day as he traveled the nation looking at the lack of power, the lack of fulfillment, and the recurring defeat within the church. He said the need is not more programs, it's not more crusades. It's that Christians who say they follow Jesus be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we are going to talk about the presence of God today. We're going to talk about what it means for us to be a spirit-filled church, for us to be a presence church in the context of what we know the church is. Now with that, I want to just address some things, okay? Because I know about 60% of our congregation gathering on Sunday is new in the last year. We, you see that we will pause and have moments where we speak words of knowledge or a prophetic wor word or pray for healing or let the worship linger. Why do we do that? Because we honor the presence of God in this church. We honor the presence of God by receiving communion. We honor him through worship. We honor through teaching his word. We honor through response to the gospel and we honor to the moments where he's whispering to our leaders other things that require us to move. And I want to be a church that's willing to throw everything out when the presence of God shows up. If revival comes, it's not going to be church as normal, and we need to be prepared for that. Are you guys okay with this? Now, with that, I know I'm speaking to a group of people that have different perspectives on the Holy Spirit. That some of us are not used to churches that do what we do or practice the way we practice the ministry we practice. And so, and there's lots of reasons for that. And I want to I want to address some of those misunderstandings or suspicion. First of all, number one, um, if there's any uh, misspelling, Alex, will you just text me so we can change it for the next? The, there's been two so far I'm catching. Um, number one, we're a work in progress. Uh, no. <laughs> Number one is you have theological reasons for why you don't pursue the Holy Spirit. Maybe you grew up like I did. You were taught Father, Son, Holy Bible. And you, uh, there's a real theology out there called cessationism, which is the belief that the gifts of the Holy Spirit um, die or ceased when the apostles died out. And that the, the canon of Scripture, the Bible that we have when it was canonized, we, after that, we no longer needed the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, that, that theology, I do not believe it's biblical. I don't think it's historical. I don't think it's practical. And I think it takes a lot of work to maintain that. You're, you're, you basically have to grow up in that tradition and read a narrow lens with outside of any historical context because we have plenty of historical movements where God did what he did in the New Testament in the 1900s, in the 1800s, in the 1500s, in the in, at 800. We have re records all over the place of God doing what he's always done. You guys okay? So some people, very few, have a theological reason. Second, most obvious, is fear. The abuse within the charismatic circles, the Pentecostal and charismatic circles, you know, where, where people have used the ministry of the Spirit to gain success, finances, and wealth, or have, have um, manipulated people for their purpose of success using the gifts in ungodly ways. We, or, or just ministering in a context that does not follow some of the guidelines for the, 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 the order and structure of the ministry and power of the Holy Spirit. So for lots of reasons, because maybe we don't have a theology or maybe we've experienced the abuse, we have some fear, so we're just more cautious. The third reason is secular influence. 
There's a great quote from Charles Kraft. He says, it is interesting and discouraging to note that even though we are Christians, our basic assumptions are usually more like the non-Christian Westerners around us than we would like to admit. Even though there is a wide discrepancy between teaching of scripture and the common Western assumptions, we often find ourselves more Western than scriptural. Western societies passed through the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the Enlightenment in a whole variety of ripples and spinoffs from these movements. And the result, God and the church were dethroned and the human mind came to be seen as savior. And so this is a great like oh, summary of where we find ourselves, which is when I go places to teach on the Holy Spirit, I always say, isn't it interesting that our culture today is actually more open to the supernatural than the church? Like the, the, the secular world, I'm at the gym and there's a guy in there talking about portals and microdosing and going to these experiences where he, he goes to different dimensions, you know? And I'm like, wow. <laughs> and then you come to the church, which is birthed by the power of the Holy Spirit, where we talk about a guy who died on a cross and then raised from the dead. Right? We talk about blind being, being able to see and we talk about resurrection and all these things. And we're like, oh, I don't want the presence of God. <laughs> Meanwhile, the people that were going around they're look, that, that aren't Christian are looking for the supernatural. They're more open to Netflix documentaries and podcast conspiracies about where we come from than, than the scripture, which is anchored in history and truth. And the church just needs to be prepared to minister in a context that is hungry for the supernatural. Yeah. You guys all right? The fourth reason is just a lack of discipleship. We haven't been discipled into the things of Jesus. So I, I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to know theologically, this is, is we're gonna teach that. I, I want you to not be influenced by secular culture, but I want you to be prepared as formed disciples of Jesus to do the things that Jesus did. He says, you will do even greater things than these in John chapter 14. So meanwhile, while the church doesn't know how to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, which is what Jesus anticipated for us, the world is suffering and looking for solutions to their problems in all the wrong places. And the smartest people, psychiatrists and psychologists in the world have tried to diagnose the human condition. Look at what three of the most famous have said in the last few hundred years. It's uh, the last hundred years that Sigmund Freud said people are hungry for love. When he tries to diagnose the human condition, he says people are hungry for love. Carl Jung says people are hungry for security. Alfred Adler said people are hungry for significance. And what we know as a church, it's this, that the only solution to the human condition is the presence of God. Just look at culture moving towards progress without God's presence and look at how broken we've become. With all of our breakthroughs in technology, with all of the influence we have in science um, and medicine and, and all these ways of connecting with people, we still are longing for something deep. We're still broken and hurting. Suicides, all-time high. Depression, anxiety, all-time high. Addictions, all-time high. The life expectancy in the U.S. keeps going down with all of this progress. What's the solution? May I present and propose? It's simply God's presence. So, we know there's a deep spiritual desire built into the human heart and we know the solution. And Jesus offers us the church. He commands us. He chose the church to continue his ministry through the same power he received from the Holy Spirit. Go to Acts chapter one. Let's go there together. Let's get in our Bibles. Acts one. Verse five, Jesus is speaking. This is a summary from last week. And if you missed it, please, please listen to that. Jesus says, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you should just circle baptized. I don't want you to think religious ceremony. I want you to understand what it means. And then in verse eight, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So within a few short passages in this, con uh, in this text, when Jesus is with his disciples preaching on the kingdom for 40 days, he talks about the Holy Spirit twice. It's recorded twice, which is a big deal. So when you don't have caps lock and you don't have emojis and you can't make this like, you know, it, it, when you're speaking in oral tradition, an author of ancient antiquity would write things multiple times so that you know this is important. And what's important for the church? It must wait for the Holy Spirit. Don't get on with the mission of evangelizing and changing the world without the gift. 
which is God's very presence. So throughout scripture, the Spirit's baptizing is described synonymously with the Spirit's promising, clothing, empowering, pouring, receiving, filling, and gifting. So whenever you read about the Spirit's baptism, we know that it comes with all of those other things. So Jesus says his ministry, and this is also in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, written in the Gospels, that Jesus will plunge his believers, his disciples, in the Spirit of God. And when he throws them into the deep end, because the word baptism that comes from this word to immerse, when he immerses his church in his presence, then they will experience power, is the word dunamis, to do the things that he was doing, but also power to be transformed, power to change. So many of us want to be different. So many of us are longing for things in our lives to look different. And what we do is we approach it the way our culture teaches us to approach it. We all have a therapist, nothing wrong with therapy. We might do a discipline or a fast. We might try to will ourselves to change. But may I suggest to you, there's no transformation that will last for eternity without God's presence in it. Your marriage issue is not just communication problems. Yes, it's communication problems. Yes, it's trauma from your past. Yes, it's behavioral issues. But it's also the lack of the presence of God. Marriage was instituted by God in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. His presence is birthing new humanity, and we need His presence to be that new humanity. How much do you need? As much as you can take. Are you baptized with the Holy Spirit? Questions emerge then for those of us that don't come from this. I'm trying to address these issues. Like, uh, if you're a Christian, are you filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit when you believe in Jesus, when, he's, when you say, I believe he's Lord, when you get saved? Or is there a separate experience? Have you thought about this? Is it, do you get saved and then you're filled? Or do you get saved and then filled and then you get, there's like another experience like in Acts 2 and you get filled? Or is there a third option and you want to know what the answer is? Yes. This is the best biblical uh, like offering I can give you. I can look at it through systematic theology, but I, I just have to show you that Acts 2, they were filled and Acts 4, they're filled again. In Acts 19, they were saved disciples and then they get filled with the Holy Spirit. We know over and over again, there are encounters where, this, where the church is filled, which is why Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to go there. Ephesians 5, verse 18 he says this to the church. He says, don't get drunk off wine, which leads to debauchery. I'll wait till you get there. You should highlight this one. Some of you just need to hear that part right now. <laughs> oh, and that one's the offensive one. <laughs> I don't even understand how we're tolerating a lack of sobriety in the church. We, we call, everyone's, oh, I'm just going to do it in moderation. That, that, that is, I, I don't know how, unless we take seriously these commands, we will really live into the things that God wants for us without being honest about this. You're like, yeah, go after alcohol. Let's go after marijuana. Let's go after greed. Let's go after unnecessary consumerism. Let's go after lust. Let's go after inappropriate anger. Let's go after judgment, which we all just did. Like, I'm one of seven. I'm, I'm all of them. So let's go. He says, do not get drunk off wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now stay here for one moment before I go on. In context, the church in the Roman Empire, as they were becoming Christian, when they would go to parties, houses, and there was alcohol, they did stuff called symposiums. These were drinking parties. It was a way to connect with Greek and Roman gods. The god Bacchus was the god of, of like partying and alcohol. And the way you connected spiritually to these deities was to drink alcohol and eat all the food with debauchery and then do, do the other things that come after you're drunk. So you, your, your cultural way of existence was not, there's no concept of moderation. It was just to get drunk. If there's one, you just drink. And so Paul's having to train the church 
to live from a different worldview and that's a Christian worldview. And so if you can be under the influence of alcohol or you can be under the influence of social media or be under, uh, uh, the, under the influence of, of a media narrative or be under the influence of your political preference or be under the influence of your broken toxic relationship or be under the influence of consumerism or defining yourself by how you look, he says, don't do that. Instead, be intoxicated with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And it's not a one-time command. It is a continual Continual present tense verb, meaning keep on being filled. Church, when we gather, it's a reminder. We've been filled with a whole bunch of stuff this week. Let's remember to stop being filled with those things and be filled with the presence of God. Can I get an amen? amen. And here's why from Rob Reimer. He says, it is the presence of God that changes us. It is the presence of God that empowers us. It is the presence of God that enables us to change the spiritual atmosphere over our family. Amen. A church, amen. A town, a city, a region. It is the presence of God that makes all the difference that we cannot make on our own, even with all our best efforts. The one irrepressible need of our life is the presence of God. I just think there's so many in this room that are really good Christians who need the presence to change. Question is, do you need power from God's presence to change? Or have you become comfortable without his power? When my son was like two or three, Ezra, we found this old, small red ATV. It's like this big. And we, we grabbed it in the back alley off of Third Street when we lived like Third and Temple. And we cleaned it all up, and he loved it. We'd push him in the backyard. I would just stand behind him and push him like this. Just all day long, and my back would hurt. And even when I was that young, it was just like I was just pushing him. He loved it. And then one day, I was like, clean it more, and I realized I popped it up. There was a, a battery inside. <laughs> and I was like, I went on Amazon, bought the charger, charged it the next day, put Ezra on. I'm like, yeah, check this out. Push the button, and it took off. And he immediately got off. And he's like, no, 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 you push me. Is that not the church? Like we're so comfortable with being anemic in power and having no power whatsoever that we'd rather push ourselves up rather than do what we were destined to do. We are to be a healing place for the nations. That's not gonna happen because you get really good at Excel spreadsheets. We're supposed to be a, a, a bulwark of truth to put on display the manifold wisdom of God for the powers and principalities. That's not going to happen because our Instagram says it. Or because you read utmost for the highest five minutes every day. You need power from on high to transform your very essence. Yes. And the only way you have access is if God just pours himself out based on your dependence. We'll get to how to open yourself in a second, but let's just keep going. Do you have power that God wants you to have? Now, I want to anchor the, the, that was all intro. Go to Acts chapter two. <laughs> this, I, I want you to be f informed by the spirit. I want you to know the spirit. I want you to be a church that longs for God's presence, that knows how to honor his presence. And, and I mean like all in your life as an individual, in your marriage, in your household, and in the gathering space when we come together once a week, this is where we come to bring our best. We say our life is on the altar. We, we come and, and we will worship. And if there's a tangible moment where the presence of God manifests, yes, he's everywhere. But scripture teaches there's also moments of manifest presence. And those moments change to movements if you watch. It's throughout history, hunger. People go and draw near to God. They seek God with everything. They lay aside the idols that weren't idols the day before, but they meet with God and now it's an idol. And they go before the Lord and they bring everything. And in these moments, God can do something. And I want you to hunger for the Lord. I want you to cultivate a hunger in your life. But you have to see it through a theological lens. I'm not talking about warm fuzzies. I'm talking about deep theological, biblical, historical, practical empowerment from the Holy Spirit. 
You cannot be a biblical church without the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no divide between spirit and word. They all exist together. You read the word, it points to the spirit. If you get baptized in the spirit, he's going to point to the word. That's how it works. <laughs> Acts 2 says this. <clears throat> Here's what I want you to see. I want you, I'm just going to read it. This is the moment the church was born. We're talking about reconstructing church. I want you to see it. Luke, the author of Acts. Can you say Luke? Great job. Um, he writes what happens through a theological lens. This is a theological narrative. And you, I want you to just read this. And then I'm going to go through and give you seven theological connections. That will be quick. So you can see this is more than just an event. Okay? Ready? Acts 2 verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fulfilled... They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came to ga- uh, together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these all who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, sorry, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pergia, Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Jerusalem, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. This is the birth of the church. Now, I know so many of us like it neat and orderly, but if you were there, how terrifying would this be? A violent wind fills a room that's closed, 120 people in this gathering when they're waiting expectantly, and now there's this violent wind. And when they look up, they see a tongue of fire. That is the craziest image that you could imagine, like a tongue of fire that just goes out and rests on everyone. You know, like if there were people like, like if that happened today, some of us might grab the the fire extinguisher, right? (laughs) Like we're not up to code. What's going on? Like we're renting this place. This is a, a significant moment, but this event occurred in the backdrop of biblical context that makes it very significant, okay? So here's some things if you wanna take notes. I wanna paint, this is a little bit of a Bible study because I love the Bible so much and I just want you to have this so you'll never read this. The birth of the church. This is the moment the church was born. What happens when the church was born? He, Luke wants you to see this. So theologically, first of all, it says when the day of Pentecost came, that Greek word for came is fulfilled. When the day of Pentecost was fulfilled. Now, the word Pentecost means 50th in Greek, and it is the combination of two Jewish events. One is the command for the festival of weeks, which is in the Old Testament, which is, which is where once a year, the people of God would bring harvest and offer their first fruits as a blessing that God brought the first fruits um, to your labor, to your harvest, and you bring it back as an offering to God. But that also became primarily for the people of God. They would come from all over Israel to Jerusalem as a practice to renew the covenant. So this was a time where the people of God remembered the law that came in Exodus 19 when God said, you will be for me a holy nation, a kingdom of priests set apart. And he went to Mount Sinai and he, he descended on the mountain with an earthquake, with fire and billowing billowing smoke. And he brought the 10 commandments and the Old Testament, the Torah, the law. Are you with me? So the, the idea that the word he uses is Pentecost fulfilled. The idea of Pentecost is the first fruits and the people of God being formed into the nation of Israel through the law and the 10 commandments. That's the backdrop. You guys good? 
The second thing, and we know this, is the Holy Spirit. The word for Holy Spirit in Hebrew is ruach. The root word in, in Greek is pneuma. And the word for, for the Spirit is spirit, wind, and breath. So we know that uniquely, when it says there's a violent wind, pneuma, it's connecting us to the word the Holy Spirit. And that the Old Testament uses the word wind, spirit, and breath all over the place. It's in the second verse in Genesis chapter one. It says, uh, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was formless and void. And now the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the winds, the spirit rook. So we have this idea of the spirit. But if you were to read um, all throughout the Old and New Testament, these are the words that are used to describe the Holy Spirit. So I just want to make this case that the wind will represent the Holy Spirit, not just the indwelling that happens that's named the Holy Spirit, but the wind represents the Holy Spirit. You guys good? The third theological connection is that we have tongues of fire and fire in the Old Testament is almost always represented as the presence of God, the tangible presence of God. And if you go to Exodus 19 verse 16, which I don't have time to read the whole thing, but let's just go there. If you were to read the story of how the God's presence dwells on Mount Sinai, you're going to catch that there's a loud trumpet. Everyone in the camp trembled. There was a cloud of lightning. Then Moses led the people out on the camp and then they stood in front of the mountain. Go to the next one. Look at this. And then it says, uh, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it with fire. So you have the presence of God, the tangible representation of the presence of God is always fire. At the altar, when it's burned, it's the presence of God. Here in this moment, Luke wants you to see it's not just the Holy Spirit that comes in a wind. It's not gonna just be the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but God's tangible presence is here. Are you with me? Okay, next one. This is a big one. The Spirit rests on everyone. And we read over this. But what you have to understand is Moses, uh, sorry, is that in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God rested on particular people at particular times for a particular purpose. So you didn't ever have this moment where the presence of God just rested on an entire community. It was a judge, or it was a king, or it was a prophet who received the Holy Spirit. And it would de he, the Spirit would depart after the time that the Spirit used that person for, which is why, why even in the theology of David in, in, in Psalm 51, after he sin, sins, he says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. That was the expectation. But it's something even deeper. Go to Exodus 34. Are you guys okay with this Bible study? I don't care if you are either way. <laughs> Exodus 34. Let's go there in our Bibles. I'll race you there. I don't have it saved. I can't type it in. It goes Genesis, Exodus Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ru that's how our kids are learning to memorize that song. Okay, Exodus 34, 33, Moses uh, asked for the glory of the Lord, and at the end of this book, near the end, uh, verse 33, uh, Moses comes down from the mountain, and it says, when Moses finished speaking to them, he put on a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with them, he removed the veil until it, he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. It's a weird passage, yeah? This is a connection to what happened with Moses when he was around the presence of God. When Moses was an intercessor for Israel, he would take off the veil and go and experience the presence and glory of God. He would dwell as an intercessor, representing Israel to God. And then he would go out and his face would glow. It's weird stuff. His face was radiant. It was beaming. It was bright that he had to wear a veil to communicate to the people of God, what God had communicated to him. He was the intercessor. Are you with me? There was one guy for all of the nation, 
one intercessor for all of the nation. And what Luke is doing in this moment is when the Holy Spirit comes, he comes and he rests on everyone. Now you are all like Moses. Now the church is filled with a bunch of intercessors who will represent God to the nations and the nations back to God. It's not for the elite. It's not for the special. It's not for the privileged. It's for the open, the humble and hungry. God's presence will dwell, not just to transform your stuff and clean up your mess, but to use you to transform the world. And without the presence, you can't do that. We can't bear witness without the witness of the power of God in our own lives. So in the Old Testament, we have this new thing happening, or this, this fulfillment of the people of God. God wanted to dwell with his people. The promises are fulfilled in Pentecost. Are you guys with me? It's too theological. You're not, okay, a couple more. I'm gonna just blow your mind. You ready? We're not even close to being done. There's three more and then we're gonna land. Here we go. And can we please have the AC on? I'm, I'm, she turned on. I don't know if it's broken. I don't feel, maybe, f I don't want fiery tongues. I want freezing cold AC tongues right now. 74, it's getting hot. Meanwhile, a snowstorm, there's no power around the nation and we're burning up. All right, here we go. Point number five, ready? It's the reversal of Babel. Okay, what, what you have to see, it's so beautiful. It says, they began to speak in other tongues. And the people say, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own languages, our own tongues. Now go to Genesis chapter 11. I just want you to see, see this because this is, the, this is like all of the Bible is coming to fulfillment through the cross, the resurrection, and then the, the, uh, the uh, Pentecost uh, Sunday. It says, 11 verse 4, this is, we know what's going on here. It's it, a bunch of people are using technology to displace God. It says, the people will say, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heavens so that they may, we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scatter, scattered over the face of the whole, whole earth. So the Lord came down to, that, to the city and, and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one uh, if as one people speak in the same language they, be, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now, this is a whole deep theological story, the Tower of Babel and what's going on here. And I've got a lot of theology to teach on this, but I'm just gonna make a point in this moment. And here's what's happening. Genesis 11, human wisdom, technology, one voice, one language being used to, to basically displace God. Human achievement, make a name for ourselves. Whose name are we supposed to represent as, as image bearers? right? Humanity is lost. God comes down and uses language to displace God. But then the Spirit comes down in Acts chapter 2, and now languages are being used to glorify God. Language is being used. The diversity of language is being heard, the declaration of wonders of God. It is the reversal of Babel. Luke is doing this on purpose. We have the fulfillment of Pentecost. We have the presence of God tangibly. We have the Holy Spirit. We have, everyone is now an intercessors. And now we have the reversal of the Tower of Babel. Two more, let's just have fun, okay? Um, it says in Acts chapter two, verse 13, I love this one. Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. They have had too much wine. Have you ever experienced the presence of God and felt a little intoxicated? Oh, more than I anticipated. <laughs> I, I know this sounds strange, but there is a, sometimes a tangible encounter where you feel this deep peace, like you were breathing in pure oxygen when the presence of God touches you, where you feel ministered to. I've had so many unique encounters over my life since I became uh, open to the presence of God, where I remember I was preaching in the UK in uh, Northern Ireland, and I, I just finished doing like a, a conference and these college students came up late at night and they're like, can we pray for you? And I was like, I guess, you know, like I just want to get out of there and eat. And 
I, as soon as they start praying, I, I had this sense like God wants to do something in me. And this is what happens. You don't have to let him do it. This is what I've learned. I have learned that if you want him to minister to you, he will go as far as you're willing to let him. So if he's like, if all of a sudden you start experiencing the pain from your past because he begins to minister to the trauma within you and you don't want to go there, you can shut down the work of God for that moment in your life. Or if he starts making you feel light, like you need to fall over or you need to sit because the, the word for the glory of God is kavod, which is weightiness. So what is it when the presence of God f- begins to minister to us? We feel like this heaviness and we need to sit. That's, that's just the glory of God. And I know we don't all have language for this. I'm giving you language from my experience. So I was beginning to experience this like, I need to sit down. I'm going to fall. So I'm like, forget falling. I don't do that. I'm going to sit down. So I sat down. And it was a clear decision in my mind. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. You sh- the Lord wants to do this. I don't want to do this. Do I let him? And I just like, okay, Lord, I'll let you do whatever you want. I'm going to go with you. And I began to experience this peace. And I was in what I could describe as like this relaxed trance where I was laying down there. I don't even know what they were praying. I was just experiencing waves of love. And, and then they, I thought it was about five minutes. It was about an hour or so, maybe 40 minutes, John was there. And John and my friend Nathaniel had to carry me out because I was, I could not, I was like stumbling. Like, I was like, I don't know what's going on. And I didn't want to do this. Like, I'm the guy that just preached. I'm creative, I'm smart, I'm intellectual. I want to be seen a certain way. And now the entire community is watching this young guy who looks like he's drunk, stumble out of church. And I sat at the only restaurant open at the time, McDonald's in Northern Ireland, laying against the window. (laughs) And it's an experience. It's it's like hard. You're like, it's so, even describing it, it feels awkward and weird. Like, what did it do to me? Honestly, it gave me a whole lot of peace. But I'll tell you this. The next few weeks when I would come into worship or the presence of God, I would immediately feel that, that thing inside of me, that sense of like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take over if you let me. And I kept shutting it down. You know, like people are like, oh, the Spirit of God is a gentleman. Yes, he is. And he's a tongue of fire. <laughs> a violent wind. And so many of you are so afraid to let him into the trauma, to let him have rule over your body, Let him heal emotions, which might start with you beginning to weep out the storehouses of tears that have been held back because you don't know where it's going to go. But if you learn to trust the Spirit, he will deal with those things and minister to you. I'm not done here, but the point is new wine. In Amos chapter 9, let's not read all this. There's this beautiful line where it says, The days are coming, declares the Lord when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes, new wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. And I will bring back my Israel back from exile. They will rebuild ruined cities and lives and and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens, TM, and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted uh, from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. It is a prophecy that new wine is coming. Are you with me, church? And what happens is they experience the new wine, and it doesn't make sense. And I got one more point and then we'll end, okay? The last one is probably the most important I want you to see because this is about Pentecost being fulfilled. It is about the first fruits. It is about the people of God. It is about the covenant that God made through the law. And if you read the story of the covenant in Exodus chapter 20, it's not just fire. It's tablets of stone. Moses is on the mountain and then he comes back after 40 days and they're worshiping an idol Baal. Golden calf is constructed. And it says in Exodus 32, 27, <clears throat> this is what the Lord said to uh, the God of Israel says, each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. neighbor. Let the Levites, uh, the Levites did as Moses commanded. And that day about 3,000 people died. 
When God created a covenant, it was about holiness. It was about living as the people of God. And they went and worshiped idols. And as a result of the law, to remain pure, the Levites went around and 3,000 Israelites were killed the day the law came down the mountain. Acts chapter 2 ends near 37. Look at this. Um, Peter stands up to the bewildered crowd and he begins to preach the gospel. He tells them about Jesus. And it says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the apostles, what do we do? Brothers, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt gener uh, generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Is that a coincidence? No, this is about the fulfillment of the vocation of Israel. The church is born and we have work to do. And you need to see it with theological eyes, with historical eyes and practical eyes that God wants to release his spirit. We are living in the age of the spirit. Next week, we'll hear a little bit more about this. I have a friend coming to preach. Chris Valentin will be here. He'll, he'll add to this. And what he's going to teach is, is he's going to talk about how Joel, Peter will say, look at this thing going on, and he'll use Joel to frame. The end times are here. The age of the Spirit is here. That God is pouring out His Spirit on everyone. God's presence is available for you. That's the point. And without the Spirit of God, we cannot be the church. So we must humble ourselves and say, come Holy Spirit. John Stott says, what we need is not more learning, not more eloquence, not more persuasion, not more organization, but more power from the Holy Spirit. And I'll just end with this, and then we're going to pray. So cue the go after the youth and the kids, because we're going to sit or stand and ask for more of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I want to just highlight to you. The disciples were in the upper room expecting every day for the promise Jesus gave them. They were praying together in the upper room for 10 days, expectant. So the Holy Spirit came and they were expectant. They were hungry. They wanted what God was promising them. They wanted to be obedient to the, to, to the words of Jesus. And so I know that some of you are those kinds of people. You are expectant. You have been prepping. You are preparing. You are urgent, ex, uh, urgently seeking the presence of God to be filled with his Holy Spirit. That's for some of you. And I want to say we must, as a church, come expectant today. We must be expectant for the presence of God to move among us. Some of you are going to be filled for the 50th time. Some of you will be filled for the first time in a tangible way. But also I want to highlight something. There were outsiders that were convicted. They were not expectant. They were not anticipating the presence of God. They were innocent bystanders to a moment an encounter that's happening. And on the outside, they're like, what's going on? And they're shocked by, what's, by, by the, the, what's going on in the church. And so they ask questions and they try to reason. They're drunk on wine. No, they're, they're what's going on? They don't understand. And then they, they're given an explanation from the power of the Holy Spirit as Peter preaches the gospel. He says, Jesus, whom you crucified, has been raised from the dead and the, we are experiencing the gift of the Holy Spirit because we know he's with the Father and you killed him, so repent. That's the gospel. Jesus, repent. Turn from your ways. Turn from the corrupt evils of this corrupt generation and choose to live for Jesus. And guess what? They're cut to the heart. And let me just say this, church, we're no longer cut to the heart. We're, we're baptized in convenience. We're satisfied with the comforts of the church we've been given or the comforts of our insulated life of self-worship. And I want to say to you today that if the Lord is convicting you, repent and turn to him and be filled. Be freed from the burden of the things that have kept you from him and come back to Jesus. He's going to not only bring a greater increase of hunger to the hungry, he's going to convict the outsiders. He's going to convict the lukewarm who have followed the ways of comfort for too long because the church doesn't have place 
without the Holy Spirit. We will not be effective without the Holy Spirit. We must be containers that the Spirit can dwell in. So if you're complacent and lukewarm, either make room for other people or get on fire. How? The first thing you have to do, church, is re-surrender your life to Jesus. You have to confess Jesus is Lord. It is so hot in here. I'm just noticing this. It's not me preaching. It's, oh, we got it. Okay, praise the Lord. When something goes wrong, God's going to move. We're going to open the doors in a second. Forget that. We'll get the cool air in here. We'll make a wind. Or maybe the Lord's just going to give us a, a breeze. A violent wind, Jesus. Let's go. <laughs> Surrender your life to Jesus. I'm not talking about a decision today that doesn't affect your Monday or affect your parenting or affect the way you interact with your roommate or your girlfriend. I'm talking about surrender your life to Jesus. Commit your ways to him. Commit yourself to him. Repent. Turn. Stop doing the things. You're like, I don't know how to repent. Just stop doing the things that you know you shouldn't do. Like, it's that simple. I don't need to read a book. You get the cliff notes. Go. Just repent. You are doing this thing. Stop. You don't need to tell everybody about it. Confess it to Jesus. Come to your friend and say, I'm done with this. This is a year of sobriety. This is going to be the year I give up social media. This is going to be a year where I stop looking at pornography. I stop doing these things. I stop using anger inappropriately. I'm not going to listen to NPR. I'm done with the crime junkie or whatever it is. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to get drunk. I'm not going to be under the influence anymore. Repent and confess. And brothers and sisters, this is the best part. And then you just humble yourself. I've gone, ar I've gone around the world to churches that are hungry for the Holy Spirit. And what I know is this, because of our successes, our pleasures, our comforts and conveniences, we are without need. We are without desire for change. We are on default setting, moving down the stream, living this comfortable life. If you want more of the Holy Spirit, he will pour himself out on you. You need all of those things but most of all, humility. I want you, Lord. Will you come into my life and fill me? Can we all stand together?